we lose neurons uh, every day, uh, or, and uh, I'll get into a little bit of the structure of the brain in a second. We start out with about 1.1 trillion cells up here, and we normally lose about 10,000 a day. That may sound like a lot, but when you start with 1.1 trillion, uh, you know, you, typically it's like 3 to 5 percent diminished by the time we get older. One drink, one drink, right? One beer, four ounces of wine, single ounce of liquor, kills 10,000 brain cells. We probably noticed that the way we get inebriated is we deprive oxygen from brain cells. The buzz is brain cells dying and drowning. They're drowning. They get, that surprises the buzz, all right? So, one drink. And which comes to me literally and figuratively, a sobering piece of data. <laughs> 10,000 green cells. Whoa. So, now I don't know if these are linked points, but right? he started off by saying that he, didn't, he, he liked to drink a glass of wine, you know, and uh, he didn't like hearing about those 10,000 brain cells. So, from the one hand, then he said, Isn't it true that there's been new science that shows that we can regenerate brain cells? Okay, you see, there might be a connection there in his two points. Uh, I've had a similar thought myself. <laughs> um, okay, so. See, so it was it was recently discovered, literally again, just in the last few years, that human beings do actually grow new brain cells. And lower, to use that expression, sorry, but lower animals, if you will, further down the evolutionary chain, uh, really grow a lot of brain cells. So it's not necessary to grow brain cells to be highly intelligent. If anything, arguably, there are inefficiencies with growing your brain cells. The most efficient way to develop a brain, well, mind rather, the most efficient way is to really improve connectivity. I think it's wonderful because really it's about relationships, isn't it? It's about relationships among neurons that really fosters uh, systemic, you know, synergistic effects. And a lot of the evolution on that connectivity this is where I visualize the Sistine Chapel. I don't know why. I see God's finger coming to Adam. Right? The evolution at the synapses where the neurons come together, right there on the very tippity tip tip tip, those are the most molecularly complicated structures in the whole body. There are like hundreds of proteins right there on that little lattice work coming together. And it's been a major area of evolution in just the last several hundred thousand years, perhaps several million years, the evolution of those little tips and how they can talk to each other. Right? So that's really where the action is. That said, uh, it, it was recently discovered that the hippocampus, again, from the hippocampus, visual spatial memory, memory for context, very important for trauma. Hippocampus is. I'm going to talk about that in my second presentation, after 10 or whatever it is, uh, about you know the impact of stress and, un, uh, and painful experiences on the brain and then what we can do about that. But anyway, um, about a thousand new neurons a day grow there. It's really promoted by exercise. So if you drink that glass of wine and don't exercise, it will affect you. On the other hand, if you drink the glass of wine and get inspired to go out and jog, you can grow new neurons. So that's one way to think about it. But other than that, we tend to not grow many neurons in the brain. I suspect that, you know, again, 1,500, 250 years from now, science will develop, develop ways to regenerate neurons. So far, that's a really huge area of research, you know, including, for example, things like spinal injury. But right now, it's not that clear. But what we can do is not grow new neurons. Who cares about growing neurons? We can grow structure. We can grow synapses. As I get to later, each neuron makes about a thousand connections with other neurons. That's a thousand. That's a lot. We can build a lot of structure there and really change things for ourselves over time. One of the most useful things we can do is to develop our own um, level of functioning, our own state of being, and our own capacity to learn over time to really help our learning curve get as steep as possible. And the opportunities there in our own brain are extraordinary. How do we be mindful? So I want to talk here, as I said at the beginning, about methods that are a little bit off the beaten track and are, um, you know, kind of brain savvy or why they actually work. Okay, and we can use these methods on the fly or we can use them in formal practice. Most of the time, we're going to use them on the fly. You know, the, length, the instruction of the Buddha, to, to uh, quote him, is that we should be mindful in the four fundamental positions, sitting, walking, standing, and lying. Um, I like the sleeping meditation a lot myself. Anyway, um, it's actually one of the hardest things to remain mindful of is speech. 
to remain mindful when I'm speaking. And that's where, actually, to go back to your point, I find it personally very helpful to keep coming back to my body while I'm talking, you know, and keep actually relaxing the throat. Um, one of the interesting things in science these days is the discovery about how embodied cognition is. One of the ways we think is we, we trigger these little body sensations. You can actually watch, if you're mindful, you can actually watch these, these triggering of body sensations or subtle motions, like a motor pattern of doing something, and that's how we think. So one way to support ourselves in terms of thinking is to do little things with the body. Like Marsha Linehan, I believe, talked about the half smile. If you smile a little bit, they've done a study in Germany. I always think, of course, it's in Germany, where they, make, they give people pencils where they, they have to frown or something. They make them frown. Or alternately, they make them hold a pencil in their mouth so they have to smile, something like that. And then while they're in that position, they have them look at cartoons or different stories and rate them like how funny they are or how sad the story is. And if they're smiling more, they rate the stories as funnier. Or if they're frowning, they rate them as less funny. See what I mean? Or less happy. And by just by changing literally the body. So in relationship, I'll do things myself all up in my heart. Uh, deliberately, if I'm talking with somebody that maybe it's a little tense, a little implant perhaps, or my family, my wife, who knows, um, you know, uh, you know <laughs> curl over and protect, you know, make myself open up, you know, heart comes out. So the mind is changing the body to benefit the mind.